Well, last week we started talking about our four dimensions, or to use our analogy, the four speakers that need to be adjusted and mixed properly so that um, they can be heard and understood. We will not be able to understand or hear the Gospels properly unless these four speakers are balanced and mixed well. And we started last week talking about the first of these four speakers, uh, these first, this first dimension, which is the story of Israel. Uh, this is a speaker that needs to be turned up louder than most readers expect. Um, the story of Israel is laid out throughout the entire Old Testament, and it ends with a question mark. It ends with something left unresolved. If you read through the entire Old Testament, that's what you're left with. A, a piece of this story has not been finished off. It hasn't been concluded. To which the life of Jesus is the answer. The life of Jesus is the climax. It is the, the culmination of the Jewish story. And when we look at the Gospels, we discover that they are retelling the history of Israel to show that the story of Jesus is the end of this long history. It is the God-ordained climax. So in order for us to understand the Gospels, what is the point of the Gospel writings? The life of Jesus. What is it all about? The only way that we can understand that is to turn up on the speaker system the, the story of Israel. So what I want us to do tonight, which I told you we were going to do last week was part one of this. This is part two. Is we are going to go to the Gospels and we are going to look at some scriptures themselves to see, to demonstrate how this is the culmination of the story of Israel. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew and we'll begin in verse 1 in just a minute. We're not going to read everything just for the sake of time. There are large chunks of Scripture that I, I wish we had all the time in the world to, to look at. Uh, but the most obvious place for us to begin is right here at the beginning with the genealogy of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew starts his Gospel off with a long genealogy from Abraham to Jesus. Most of us probably skip this when we're reading. Right? The genealogies are not a whole lot of fun. Okay? Um, so-and-so begets so-and-so begets so-and-so begets so-and-so begets so-and-so. And you read that for an entire chapter, and at some point you just go, okay, we got it. Yeah, a lot of people had a lot of babies, and then Jesus came. However... To do that is to miss the point of why Matthew puts this genealogy in here. Matthew puts this genealogy in here for a very, very important reason. Now, I do not, I'm not going to read all of it. Notice that though, that it starts in verse 2 with Abraham. Okay? And it ends um, basically when in verse 16, when Jesus is born, who is called the Christ. Now, if you know Jewish language, Christ means anointed one, the chosen one. That is the title of uh, the Messiah. So Matthew is saying right here at the very beginning, from Abraham to this Jesus, this Yeshua, born of Mary, who we call the Christ. And this is what I want you to see. Look at verse 17. And all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation of Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. Okay? Now, I want you, we're going to hang there for a minute because that is very important. But let's just hang there for a second. Most Jews in Jesus' day did not believe that the exile was over with. Yes, they believed the exile to Babylon was over with. Most, uh, a good number of Jewish people came back out of Babylon captivity. Remember, some just stayed there. Some stayed in Babylon. Didn't even go back to um, Jerusalem. But many, many did. However, the Jews rightly never believed that they were out of exile. 
they were still being ruled by pagans overall. In fact, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 36 says this, Here we are. Now this is back after they've come out of Babylonian exile. They're back in Jerusalem. Nehemiah 9, 36. Here we are, slaves to this day, slaves in the land that you gave to our ancestors to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. So we're here, but we're still not free. So in the first century, the Jews did not believe that they had actually experienced their full deliverance that was to come. And in Daniel chapter 9, okay, uh, verses 24 and following, God tells Israel, you're going to be in Babylonian captivity right, for 70 years. That was what was set up. But then God says this to them, that your full deliverance is not going to happen until there are seven seventies. Now that should not surprise us. All right, It's not just 70 years. 70 years was just Babylonian captivity. But full deliverance was not going to come for seven seventies. Now, it seems like a long time to wait, doesn't it? Seven seventies. But if you were a Jewish person, that number would have a particular ring to it. That number would jump out at you. Every seven days, what did they have? The Sabbath, didn't they? Every seven years, they had a sabbatical year. And every seven times seven years, they would have a jubilee. So, every seven years, you rest. I mean, every se- I'm sorry. On the seventh day, you rest. Every seventh year, the land rests. And every 50 years, all debt is forgiven. So, you need to get in your mind this language that the Jewish people would use. This, this 7 times 10, which was 70, or 7 times 70, like this, all this language was, was restoration, jubilee, sabbatical language for the Jewish people. All of it. That's very, very important to understand. The jubilee, right, that occurred every seven times seven years, this jubilee is when slaves were freed, when land was restored to its original owner, when things got put back as it should be. But 70 times seven? That sounds like the jubilee of all jubilees. This, that number, 70 times 7, that is the jubilee of all jubilee when finally deliverance comes and redemption comes for Israel in its completion. This was the hope Israel was waiting for. At the time of Jesus, Israel was still waiting for the completion of the 70 times 7 from Daniel 9. They were still waiting for it. They were like, Hey, listen, the 70 years, yes, that has come to an end. We have experienced some sort of deliverance and jubilee because we get to go back to Israel. But you know what? Our full deliverance hasn't happened yet. We're still waiting on the 70 times 7 to come. The ultimate jubilee to come. And what Matthew does in his genealogies, if you are thinking Jewishly in that period, It is no doubt that Matthew is making it clear that Jesus is the fulfillment of the 70 times 7. Instead of years, he does it with with genealogies, with generations. All the generations from Abraham to Jesus were 14 times 3. Right? He breaks up. There's 14 generations from Abraham until they went to Babylon to captivity. I mean, until David... From David to Babylonian captivity is 14. From Babylonian captivity until Jesus was 14. 14 times 3, right? Or six sevens. Six sevens. With Jesus being the final seventh seven. Matthew's doing this on purpose. If you're thinking like a Jew, you catch this language. We don't think like Jews very good, right? That's why we got to do some hard work. Right? To understand how this is the completion of the story of Israel. 
Matthew is saying, listen, the Jubilee is here. And it, it has come in a person. Jesus is the Jubilee that you have been waiting for. You can go all the way back to the very beginning when God says on the seventh day you shall rest. Jesus is the one who brings sabbatical rest. Go all the way back to the, the sabbatical year where the land rests. That's a picture of Jesus. And the 70 times 7 that Daniel told you about finds its culmination in Jesus. He is the Jubilee in person. Jesus has come to save Israel from their sin. Now, I want to make something very clear. Yes, when Jesus says, I have come to save my people from their sin, He is, it is true, individuals would repent and believe in the name of Jesus. Okay, I am not dismissing that whatsoever. Okay, individuals would repent and believe in Jesus. There would be personal forgiveness. But to think like a Jew and read that means the end of exile. We are redeemed. We are forgiven. Our exile is now over with in Jesus. Lamentations chapter 4 verse 22 if you want to turn there with me, after Jeremiah. Lamentations chapter 4, verse 22. I just want you to see this. This is just one of the verses I could have chosen from. Verse 22, Lamentations chapter 4. The punishment of your iniquity, O daughter of Zion, is accomplished he will keep you in exile no longer, but your iniquity, O daughter of Edom, he will punish. He will uncover your sins. They were waiting for this ultimate forgiveness to come. And with this ultimate forgiveness comes redemption out of exile. That's what the Jews were waiting for. Jesus comes and Matthew is saying, it has come. It has come in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, is that what Israel was looking for? Were they looking for a, a one who would come and not physically deliver them out of their captivity from Rome? No. I mean, that's what they were waiting for. Yeah, absolutely understandably. And, and, and we're going to see this. We're going to see this paradox over and over and over again here in the Gospels. They are waiting for the Messiah and their story to be completed. And what Jesus has done is he has completed their story, but in a different way than they were looking for. So he's come, but he's come in a way that was different than the way that they thought. It's very hard for us to grasp this point today. The life of Jesus is a recapitulation of key elements from the story of Israel. Let me tell you what I mean by that. If you knew the story of Israel very, 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 very well, if you were a Jewish person and, it, and the story of Israel was drilled into your head since the time you could think for yourself, and it was just in your... You had, you had the first five books of the Bible memorized by the time you were 12 years old. Like this was just drilled into your head over and over and over again. When then you read the Gospels, you would see Jesus doing things that were like people in the Old Testament. For instance, when Jesus stands on a mountain and gives a famous sermon, that would look like Moses. For a moment, Jesus would answer His critics about the actions of the Sabbath, he sounds like David. For a moment, he calls and names 12 disciples, like Jacob. For a moment, he heals the sick and raises the dead, like Elijah or Elisha, and so on and so on. These are like flashbacks for Jewish people. If Jewish people are reading the Gospel of Matthew, they are seeing Jesus do things, and they're going, that's what Elijah did. That's what Moses said. That's what David did. So in Jesus is this retelling of the Jewish story that finds its culmination in Him. Matthew then is telling the story in such a way so that Matthew is saying, this is it. 
This is what we've been waiting for, even though you never would have thought it'd be like this. So what's the point of telling the story of Jesus as the climax of the story of Israel? In Israel's scripture, scriptures, the reason Israel's story matters is that the creator of the world chose and called Israel to be the people through whom he will redeem the world. So why is it important for us Gentiles to fall in love with the idea that Jesus is the culmination of the Jewish story? Because the story of your salvation runs through the Jewish story. God chose Israel and called Israel and culminates Israel's story with Jesus and God chooses that nation to be the nation by which His glory is spread through all the world. The call of Abraham is the answer to the sin of Adam. Israel's story is the microcosm and the beating heart of the world story. What God is doing for Israel, God is going to do in relation to the entire world. That is what it is meant to be Israel. is to be the people who, for better or for worse, are carrying the destiny of the world on their shoulders. And of course they fail miserably, and that's why Jesus has to be the climax of the story. Mark now. I told you all ago that the gospel writers portray Jesus as the goal of Israel, but they do it own uh, they do it all in their own way. No gospel writer tells it exactly the same way. Mark indicates that the arrival and baptism of Jesus are the moments in which the prophecies of Isaiah and Malachi find their ultimate redemption of God's people of God returning to rescue his people. Turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. We're going to read verses 2 and 3. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way? The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Look at verse 9. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit ascending upon him. And the voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Mark picks up here, and throughout his entire gospel, the, the major theme from the ancient Hebrew scriptures, that Israel's God is fulfilling all his ancient promises. And he's going to do so in a radical new way. God has made all these promises to Israel, and Mark is now saying all of these promises are going to have their fulfillment in Jesus. This new thing that God is doing. He's always promised it, but He's fulfilling it in a new way. Not just the way that you thought. That's why Jesus says in verse 15, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. But that's not the way we thought the promises were going to be fulfilled. Jesus saying, the time of fulfillment has come. God has promised this whole time that jubilee is coming. The ultimate jubilee is coming. The oh, Well, here I am. Now repent and believe the gospel. The kingdom is is at hand. The, he says in chapter 2, verse 19, the bridegroom has arrived at last for the wedding party. He says in chapter 4, verses 1 two, through 20, that the fresh seed is being sown and it's going into the ground and true people of God, it will rise up in proper soil. In chapter 8, verse 29, Peter declares Jesus to be the Messiah. So, all throughout Mark, 
Jesus is fulfilling the story of Israel even though this requires them to understand the story in a different way than what they were thinking. They were thinking it's going to be fulfilled one day, one way, God sends Jesus, and it's going to be fulfilled in a radical new, different way than you thought it was going to be. You coming out of exile doesn't mean you're going to be freed from Rome right now, but it does mean you'll be freed from your sin, and you'll be freed from death. You'll be freed from the devil. You'll be freed from the rule of the world over you. Maybe not physically, but certainly spiritually. This is now being fulfilled. Then we come to the book of Luke. Scripture being fulfilled is precisely the point made by Luke at key points in his gospel. Luke structures the opening so that we hear the, the background of the great stories of Samuel and David all pointing to the arrival of a new king. The true king. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1. I, I want you to... I just want to read these. I want to read the songs or the prayers that Mary and Zechariah pray. Luke chapter 1 verse 46. Listen to these prayers in light of Jesus fulfilling the Jewish story. In light of Jesus being the culmination of the Jewish story. Verse 46, here's Mary. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For He has looked on the humble estate of His servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Why? For His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and He exalts those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich He has sent away empty. He has helped His servant in Israel in remembrance of His mercy as He spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to the offspring forever. Just to let you know, her entire prayer is pretty much rip from the pages of the Old Testament. She is saying what we were waiting to be fulfilled is now being fulfilled inside my womb. Deliverance for Israel has come. The fulfillment of our entire story is the size of a peanut in my belly. It's crazy. Look at verse 68. Now Zechariah is praying. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He has, has visited and redeemed His people. <clears throat> See, he's, he's putting the pieces together, right? Zechariah is saying, we've waited for our ultimate redemption, our ultimate jubilee, we've waited for the fulfillment, and now here it is. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of His servant David, all prophesied in the Old Testament. As he spoke the, by the mouth of his holy prophets from old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all those who hate us. To show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. You hear that? The oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him in all of our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. And you will go before the Lord and prepare the way to give knowledge of salvation to the people. Of course, he's talking about John, right? Now, now remember, when you read knowledge of salvation to the people in the forgiveness of their sins... If you're just thinking about the, the American version of forgiveness of sins, you're missing the weight of what that would have meant for a Jewish person. It's not just personal repentance and forgiveness. Of course it means that. But it also means ultimate jubilee. Ultimate salvation has now come. And John, you're going to get to be the one that goes before Jesus to preach that salvation is here that the, the, the freedom from exile has arrived because of the tender mercies of our God whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. They've been waiting for it. We've been wanting the promises to be fulfilled and now here it is. This theme runs straight through the gospel. It's emphasized in other passages of scripture like chapter 22, flip there, to chapter 22, verse 37. J 
Jesus talking to his disciples says this, For I tell you that the scripture must be fulfilled in me. What scripture can he, the only scripture he can be referring to is the Old Testament. It's the only one they got. He's saying, For I tell you that this scripture that we have must be fulfilled in me. I am the fulfillment of everything in the Old Testament. Scripture is reaching its goal in me. Even Jesus' closest, closest followers cannot begin to see the strangeness of all the events. His arrest, His trial, His death. How can this be the fulfillment of everything promised? Of course, in chapter 24... We have Jesus walking on the road to Emmaus with two of his followers. He's talking to them, and he basically walks up next to them and says, Hey, what's going on, guys? And they go, What do you mean, what's going on? You haven't heard? You haven't heard what that our our leader, our rabbi, our teacher, the one we thought that was the Messiah has been killed. Oh, you don't say. That's Sandler paraphrase there. <laughs> but then look at verse 25. And Jesus said to them, O oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe what the prophets have spoken. What, who spoke? Prophets spoke. Prophets told you how all this was going to go down. You just, you just weren't ready for it this way. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into His glory? Verse 27, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, He interpreted to them in all the Scriptures the things concerning what? Himself. You see what happens if we turn the speaker way, way down? And we immediately just think, this is, you know, individual salvation just for, you know, everybody who's ever come from Adam. Of course that's true. But if you turn the speaker of it being the story of Israel all the way down, you're missing so much of what the life of Jesus is about. The entire scriptures find their fulfillment in Jesus in a new and profound way. And then John so this paradox that we see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that the, the events involving Jesus are to be seen as a fulfillment of the story of Israel even though it's not being fulfilled the way that they were expecting or the way that they were wanting. All of that is said at the very beginning of the book of John. John chapter 1. I'm, I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I just want you to see that John takes us right back to the beginning. He takes us to Genesis and Exodus. You see how he takes us in Genesis real quick, right? Where he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him not anything was made that was made. We're right back at the beginning of Genesis. But then we have the echoes of Exodus. When you get to verse 14... <coughs> Now it says, and the word became flesh, literally translated, and tabernacled with us. Tabernacled among us. Now if you were a Jew reading that, where would your mind go? It would go back to the book of Exodus. When the tabernacle was set up and God's presence came down and dwelt in that tabernacle, now John is saying, I'm retelling that story, but I'm retelling it in the word. I'm retelling it in Jesus. So I'm taking our Old Testament scriptures and I'm letting you know that all of that is this new, the fulfillment of all this is this new creation that's happening in Jesus. That's the way he frames this entire thing. This is where Israel's history and with it, the entire world's history have reached their moment of destiny. His own people though, we're not looking that way, were they? 
So he came to his own people and his own people received him not. This is why the theme of Jesus' Messiahship is highlighted repeatedly along with the constant questions as to whether someone like Jesus could really be the one whom Israel was longing for. John chapter 1 verse 45 and, um, and 46. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Yeshua of Nazareth, son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can any good come from Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. Right? They're, they're having to wrestle with this question. Can the Messiah come the way that this Jesus is saying it's going to come? Is, is the culmination of our entire story going to come this way? Uh, there's a really good line in a hip-hop song that says, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? The only thing good came out of Nazareth. I'm like, that's biblical. <laughs> I just need to listen to more Christian hip hop, I guess. <laughs> this whole theme goes through the entire book. Turn to John chapter 5, verse 39. Jesus says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Now remember. What I mentioned in our very first session, I know it was a few weeks ago, but when we hear eternal life, yes, it does mean life without end. It does mean that. But Jewishly speaking, it carried with it a newness of life. A life in the new, in the new age. The life in the new creation. The life in the new thing that God is doing. So he's saying you're searching the scripture, scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. You're searching to find out how, this, how you're going to live in this new thing that God is doing. And then he says, And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. You're, you're trying to search out how you're going to live in this new age that God is going to do. Yet they're pointing about me and you reject me. And yet you think you're going to have life in this new age? It doesn't work that way. The only way you're going to have life in this new age is in me. The scriptures tell all about it. Jesus says to Moses, or Jesus says that Moses wrote about him in 546. He says that Abraham looked forward to him in 8, 30 through 59. All the lines draw the eye up to the faint scene in which Jesus announces God's kingdom. New creation before Caesar's representatives. While Israel's official leaders declare, we have no king but who? Caesar. Here is their king the culmination of their entire story. And what do the religious leaders say? We'd rather have the pagan king. And there in front of them stands the culmination and the climax of their entire story. And they say, they yell out, we have no king but Caesar. The paradox of the king of kings hanging on a cross. Right? Right? Here's the fulfillment of the story. And he hangs on a cross. The final moment of the fulfillment of, of this great scriptural story is Jesus hanging on the cross. And what is, what is his last words? It is finished. I have finished the story of Israel. I am the ultimate climax of Israel. I've finished it. It's here in me. The story's been completed. The story of creation. The story of God's covenant with Israel. Now the new creation can begin. And what is the very first thing that happens in the new creation? Jesus rises from the dead. What happens in the new creation? Life. Jesus rises from the dead beginning of this new creation. Now the new covenant can be launched as disciples are sent out into the world equipped with the Spirit of God. This is how Israel's story reaches its goal. This is how now the story of Israel bears fruit in all the world. Because the entire world now, through Jesus, and the Jews first, and then also the Greeks, but the Greeks get it through the story of Israel. 
you turn down the story of Israel, you don't understand what the Gospels are all about. You're going to miss so much. Because if you turn this speaker too far down, and you don't hear this story, the story of Israel culminating in Jesus Christ, then you can read the Gospels a million times, and things are not, not going to make near the sense that it should make to you. It's not going to have the weight that it should make unless we are constantly aware in reading the Gospels that they are telling the story, the Jesus story, in such a way that it is bringing Israel's story. We've got to hear that properly in harmony. This is the first speaker of our sound system. It must be turned up to its proper volume. The story of Jesus' life burst upon an unready first century Jewish world. All those parables of the returning master or Lord coming to his own. This radical new thing that God was doing was nevertheless the thing that he had promised to do all along. I have said we make a grave error if we disconnect. If we think that Jesus came and brought this a broader new religion right as if the jewish story doesn't just run right to jesus and then jesus is the continuation of it all just in a radical new way it's not a new thing it's just a way that we weren't expecting